it's time for us to talk about the U.S. midterm elections. Now, there are probably lots of people who don't care about the U.S. midterm elections, but as you know, when the U.S. catches a cold, everybody on earth gets deathly ill. And um, we know that the U.S. economy and the inflation that is going on there and all the incredible amounts of money that Joe Biden and his uh, government have been pouring into the economy in America has caused a massive, you know, wave and counter effect here in South Africa, something that we're all dealing with, not just here in South Africa, but all over the world. The politics of the United States are interesting to people like me. And I think that there are plenty of reasons why we should be paying attention in order to get a more balanced approach than you might get from, let's say, the mainstream news channels, who, whether you've realized it or not, have an agenda. And if that hasn't become clear to you over the last three years, you really haven't been paying attention. Breitbart News is one of the uh, biggest news organizations in the United States. I suppose you could identify them as slightly right-leaning, but they try their best to be objective. And like many news networks in the world, are still trying to bring you the facts and then opinions as a secondary effect of that. One of the people who is responsible for making sure that Breitbart News know what they're doing and keep doing what they're doing is the senior editor at large and a host at Breitbart. He's also got a bunch of other outlets where he's busy doing his thing. His name is Joel Pollock. He's no stranger to our audience. Joel, it's good to see you. How are you? Great. So good to be back with you, Gareth. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me on Breitbart the other day. I actually got a whole bunch of friends of mine in the US who, who are clearly fans of, uh, of your show and your channel. Uh, telling me that they were surprised to see me on there. <laughs> well, you were fantastic. You were on for an entire hour. That almost never happens. It was a fantastic interview. But I want to just respond to something you said. We are the biggest or among the biggest in terms of traffic, but we're not the biggest in terms of size. We actually have a relatively small organization. We have about 100 employees. So we actually punch above our weight in terms of web traffic and social media. And then you were very kind to describe us as slightly right of center. We're actually identified as being firmly on the right. And we okay. <laughs> are accurate. I wouldn't say objective. You know, this idea of objectivity is a bit of a myth. But we do strive to be accurate. And in many ways, we have to be more accurate than the New York Times or the Washington Post because we are a small company. We are viewed as an upstart. And we are more easily excluded from things. If the New York Times gets a story egregiously wrong for years, as they did with the Russia collusion story, they're not in any danger of losing their ability to publish on Facebook, for example. But if we get one minor mistake wrong in an article about a politician no one's ever going to hear about again, then we can get kicked off of social media if we do it three times in a row within 90 days. So we are actually so vulnerable that it makes us more accurate. Well, there's also tremendous scrutiny. And while we're talking about Breitbart, you might just want to clear this up because as I understand it, <clears throat> currently, because the media environment skews left so really, you know, it's, 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 it's a complete imbalance, not just in, in the US, but pretty much everywhere in the Western world. Anybody who has an opinion that is centrist, not to say slightly right wing, is considered far right, you know, and they talk about far right extremists. And that's happened with Breitbart. People have called you far worse than that, too. Why do you right. think it is that the media business in general has for such a long time slanted to the left? And why do you think it is that so many people in the media business vote left? Well, it has a lot to do with the reasons people go into the media business. Right now, when you look at the journalists who lead coverage in major institutional media outlets, Many of them are activists who became writers or became journalists because they wanted to change the world. And media is a great way of influencing opinion, shaping people's minds, directing policy. And so a lot of people who feel that the world is not as they would like it to be and they want to see it change in rather revolutionary ways go into media. And therefore, it's almost always left of center based simply on employees alone. That also relates to ownership of the media. We're used to criticisms dating back into the mid 20th century of corporate media ownership and that the interests of media companies as corporations are so tied into profits that they'll never go fully revolutionary left. But what's happened lately is that you've seen the rise of these mega billionaires who are able to buy media properties and run them at a loss in order to make their own points of view more influential. So that has happened with a variety of publications, you know, Amazon.com CEO Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post and he has left wing views and he uses the Post 
arguably, to advance those views. He certainly doesn't use the post to criticize those views. So mm -hmm. you're seeing what is almost a Game of Thrones among the world's elite rich, many of whom have their own ideas about how they want to change the world and run it according to their own designs. And so it's leaning left in terms of ownership as well. Well, that's a, that's a perfect answer. It brings me straight to Elon Musk and Twitter, which is also the big story of the last two weeks. He's apparently moving very fast. He's already uh, slashed the staff. He's realized, uh, and I saw a, a retweet of yours, that he's decided there are too many managers and not enough people who are actually doing coding there. <laughs> right. Um, he's, also, he's also decided to get rid of some of the people who've been responsible for some of the most egregious and outlying excesses of Twitter in the past couple of years, things that have probably put people like me, certainly, and, and maybe you off of the platform, because it's just been a place where there's been very little uh, attempt even to bring any kind of balanced approach to any discussion. If it isn't uh, towing the, 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 the leftist line, it seems to just have fallen off the radar on Twitter and have been deliberately kept off of there. I hear that um, even President Trump may be making a comeback on Twitter. Well, how do you feel about this? And what do you think Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter is all about? Because some people still say it, it's just a stunt. He doesn't really care. How do you feel it's going? Elon Musk is a very complex character. We can get into that in a moment. But overall, the acquisition of Twitter, the fact that he's bought Twitter, that he has finally fired the CEO and the other leading Twitter officials who were responsible for all the censorship not just of Donald Trump, but also of entire news stories like the Hunter Biden laptop story. That's the first time we've had any accountability for the censorship that happened in the 2020 election. And Musk is in favor of free speech, at least on that platform. So it's a huge benefit to democracy in the United States that this major public square is now once again open to people who want to state their views. You can question now whether Musk really believes in free speech. Actually, it's something people question a lot at Breitbart because his business interests take him into partnership with the Chinese Communist Party quite often in China. And right. Tesla and Elon Musk are seen as being quite all right with censorship in China, especially censorship of criticism of their operations. So I'm not sure he's quite the free speech absolutist he makes himself out to be. And of course, he has his own commercial interests at stake in almost anything he does. He also is prone to crazy statements. He was sued a while back for calling someone a pedophile during a rescue at a cave in Thailand. I don't know if you remember that, but I do he won that case barely. But he gets himself into trouble. He got himself into trouble on Twitter by spouting a kind of conspiracy theory about the assault on Nancy Pelosi's husband, the Speaker of the House. Her husband was assaulted at home by a crazy person, and he basically gave credence to a conspiracy theory. So he gets himself into trouble. But I think that's the point. I think the point is that you have to have the right to be wrong. You have the right to offend people. You have to have the right to make jokes. One of the things Musk said when he took over Twitter formerly was that humor is now allowed again on Twitter. And legions of meme makers and joke writers responded with glee. So the public forum has become more interesting, it's become more fun, and it's become more open. It's really interesting to see the reaction that the rest of the media have had. The establishment media outlets are tearing their hair out over Musk owning Twitter, even though they themselves in many cases are owned by billionaires. Mm -hmm. They're very upset at the idea of freedom of speech. They like the idea of regulated speech. That's the only environment in which they and the ideas that they support can survive. So Musk is doing a great job disrupting what had become a very conformist, calcified conversation in the media. He's reopened the Internet to what it used to be, which was a platform for people who are often not able to be heard in other ways. And just as one fellow South African to another, I mean, the fact that a guy from Pretoria is now controlling the world, basically, <laughs> is kind of amazing. I talked to my dad who didn't really have an opinion one way or the other. My dad grew up in Johannesburg and Yeovil, went to Yeovil Boys and King Edwards. And he said, well, let's just take a moment to appreciate the fact that a guy who went to Pretoria Boys is now controlling Tesla and Twitter and just about everything else and is going to Mars. I mean, it's an amazing moment for people with some South African background. Well, let's not underestimate also the power of, of Twitter, the, the way it's been used by the, 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 these kind of blue ticks, uh, you know, the, 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 the verified people on Twitter to destroy careers, to cancel people. Really, without Twitter, I don't think it's possible 
to to do the sort of cancellation whole scale that people have been doing on that right. platform. And that's probably a good thing for everybody because there's been a lot of, of really suspicious and dodgy behavior by um, right. all kinds of parties on there with respect to this. And, and in a positive sense, Twitter is used by journalists, whatever their political persuasion, to come up with story ideas, to find details, to look for witnesses or people who will comment on something. Twitter has become almost part of the process of creating journalism. And that's the real value proposition in this investment for Elon Musk, because by owning this one company, he's actually able to exert an outsized influence on the media. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, but that's just one paper. Elon Musk owns Twitter, and through Twitter, he can affect just about everybody all over the world. So it's a much bigger investment, and it's much more powerful. It's got a multiplier effect across multiple media that he's managed to achieve now. So we'll see where it goes. But as long as he sticks to this agenda of free speech, I think it's going to move in a very positive direction, not just in the United States, but around the world. Okay, so um, because I'm aware of, of how little time I have with you, because we, you and I could talk for hours and hours about the US elections and about politics in general, there is one other story which I'm completely confused by, mostly because I was out of the loop um, over the last three days. And I saw this Paul Pelosi story, and it, it makes no sense to me. It probably doesn't make sense to you or a lot of other people who have been paying attention either. What is going on here? Um, what, what was this? Is this a, a really bad false flag operation? Is it one lunatic who decided to behave as lunatics do in an unpredictable fashion? Is there something going on here that reflects uh, on, on the career of Paul or Nancy Pelosi? What does this actually mean? I think the simplest and likeliest explanation is that it is one lunatic in San Francisco and that it's part of a broader story about San Francisco rather than a story about politics in general. San Francisco has become a dangerous city. It is still the most beautiful city in the United States in terms of sheer geography. It's a wonderful place to visit. I was just there last month, but it is becoming much more dangerous in terms of street crime, homelessness, open air drug use. And Paul Pelosi was a victim of that kind of crime. The individual who attacked him lived something of a vagrant lifestyle in an area called Berkeley, which is across the bay from San Francisco, but is known to be very left wing and is often filled with very eccentric types. It also is home to one of the best universities in the world, but it tends to cultivate personalities who are really on the edge and not just politically or ideologically or cre creatively, but also in a sense of mental health. I mean, there are a lot of people who hover around that university, who hover around San Francisco, who are not exactly healthy people. And this fellow seems to have entertained a wide variety of conspiracy theories, left and right. He was apparently part of a nudist movement, militant nudism. I mean, I don't even know what that is, but, <laughs> but he was part of it. And he decided that Nancy Pelosi was the problem. So he went to the Pelosi residence and somehow he gained access. And during a struggle, he hit Paul Pelosi in the head with a hammer and Paul Pelosi, the husband of Nancy Pelosi, was taken to surgery. He will hopefully recover fully, but he's in his 80s. And that's a very serious struggle for anybody, let alone someone who is of that age. And immediately the media turned it into a political event they alleged that this was connected to Republicans. President Joe Biden, who's now facing this very tough midterm election on November 8th, he claimed that the assailant who was saying, where's Nancy, where is Nancy, allegedly, had some sort of connection through that phrase to the January 6th Capitol rioters last year who wandered through the halls of the Capitol saying, where's Nancy? So, you know, Asking where someone is doesn't necessarily mean you ascribe to some ideology across the country. But this guy was crazy and his craziness latched on to some conspiracy theories, most of which appear to have been right wing, but not exclusively. But it's really a, a story about mental illness and crime in San Francisco. The one very interesting thing I think about it, other than some of the theories, you know, you've seen different theories about what he was doing there. Was he let in? Did he break in? Was Paul Pelosi maybe up to something? I, I think the simple explanation is that this guy was there. He wasn't supposed to be there. And Paul Pelosi called the police and tried to manage the situation. It did so rather well, actually. He dialed the emergency number and he kept the phone on. He didn't hang up so that the police would hear whatever happened. So I think he actually may have saved, saved himself some even greater harm. 
But the, the real story is why was there no security or very little security at the Pelosi residence? She is the Speaker mm. of the House, Nancy Pelosi is, which means she is third in line to the presidency. If some terrible accident, God forbid, took the lives of the president and vice president, the Speaker of the House becomes the president. So Nancy Pelosi is really third in command. I know it's a bit scary when you consider her politics, but she's third in line for the presidency. And it's amazing that her home isn't better defended. It also illuminates something for me, at least. And this is a view I put forward with a little bit of trepidation because I don't want it to be miscon misconstrued. But there's long been a question about why the Capitol was undefended or very lightly defended on January 6th. And... Right. I think we just learned what may be the answer, which is maybe Nancy Pelosi just does not take security that seriously because there have to be so many people, foreign actors, crazies on the streets of San Francisco, whoever, people who want to get at the Pelosi's. And in order to get at them, you don't have to get at Nancy herself. You can do something to her residence. You can, in this case, assault her husband. It's a real national security problem. It's actually rather confusing as to why she didn't have more security there. The only answer I can come up with is that she prefers to have things that are paid for by the public, paid for by the taxpayer, because it would cost her money. She's a very wealthy woman, but it would cost her money yeah. to protect her residence. So I can only imagine that that's the reason she isn't doing it. She's so used to receiving all this public benefit that she doesn't take responsibility for protecting her own property and her own family. But that's speculation. So it's a little bit dangerous, but it is interesting to me. All right. So you mentioned January the 6th. How important do you think that is? Because the, the Democrats seem to be placing quite an emphasis on it and have all year. How much uh, of an emphasis do you think January the 6th is going to have? What influence will it have on people's voting? And what are the big issues that are driving people to the polls and that will get them to vote either for the Democrats or the Republicans, in your opinion? So January 6th will have absolutely no impact on these upcoming midterm elections. The midterm elections are called that because they, hap they happen exactly halfway in the middle of a president's four-year term. And in these elections, we are only voting for the members of Congress, that is to say, members of the House of Representatives on the one side and members of the Senate on the other. We have a bicameral legislature, and there are 435 members of the House of Representatives. Every single one of them is up for re-election every two years. On the Senate side, we have 100 senators, and only one third of them are up for re-election every two years. They serve six-year terms, and so they rotate 33, 33, 34, basically. So one third of the seats are up for re-election this year. That is enough to shift control of the Senate, because right now there is a 50-50 deadlock between the Democrats and the Republicans on the Senate side. Democrats have a slight majority in the House of Representatives, but there is a 50-50 tie in the Senate, the reason Democrats effectively have control in that situation is because the vice president of the United States casts the deciding tie-breaking vote in the event of a deadlock in the Senate. So Vice President Kamala Harris voted with her party to effectively exercise control over the Senate rules that gives Democrats control of the chamber. That could change. So the midterm elections are really about the president's performance and the performance of Congress. Even though Joe Biden is not on the ballot, his policies and his party certainly are. The number one issue in the United States right now is the inflation rate and the economy. People are absolutely outraged by the level of prices, how quickly things are going up. And they're also terrified of what is going to have to be done to control inflation. The Federal Reserve Bank has already raised interest rates substantially. They're going to raise rates even more, which means many people believe, and I think correctly, that a recession is around the corner. We had two consecutive quarters of negative growth earlier this year. We now had positive growth in the third quarter. But generally, the accepted definition of a recession is two consecutive declines in the economy, two consecutive contractions. Next year, many people fear there is going to be an even greater and deeper decline as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, which raises the cost of borrowing, which also raises the cost that people have to pay for their credit cards, the mortgages, the bonds in their homes, that sort of thing. So there's a huge level of financial anxiety. And in this case, the finger of blame points squarely at the Democratic Party. And it's rare that you get such a clear case in economics, in public policy. But 
When Donald Trump left office in January 2021, the inflation rate was 1.4%. And now it's well above 8%. It has approached 9% in recent months. And you can pinpoint the moment at which it began to take off as the moment that Joe Biden signed legislation passed by Democrats in the Congress without a single Republican vote. They passed this legislation to add yet another round of spending to the COVID-19 relief spending that Trump had already spent. When Trump spent the money, it was understood by everybody to be an emergency. He was spending way more money than we had. He was borrowing to spend, but people understood it was a response to the emergency of the coronavirus. When Democrats get into office, they believe very strongly in spending on government programs anyway, aside from the military, which they want to cut, but they believe in spending on government programs. And so when a Democrat comes into office and spends a lot of money, people change their expectations. They expect that the money will continue to flow. And so inflation climbed very rapidly from less than 2% to nearly 10%. And that is the direct result of Biden's policies. In fact, he wanted to spend more money. And it's only because one or two Democrats defected in the Senate on that specific question that he was unable to do so. But he wanted to spend trillions of dollars more than they were actually able to spend. That would have made things much worse. So the public is outraged about it. They know that people are going to lose jobs because of the upcoming rate hikes and the recession that people imagine is going to happen. People have lost a lot of money in the stock market this year. And there's just a general sense of economic anxiety. The other big issue that has surged in recent months is crime. And, you know, crime is relative when you talk to people who live in South Africa for whom dealing with violent crime has become, unfortunately, an everyday reality. But there are cities right now in the United States which feel a bit like South Africa in terms of that sense of having to look about you at all times, not leaving anything in your car, having to worry about where you've parked, having to worry about the electric gate at your house as you enter. These are parts of everyday South African life. They are now becoming commonplace in cities like San Francisco and cities like Chicago, where I grew up. Here in Los Angeles, there have been some terrible home invasions, some murders by criminals, sometimes by deranged homeless people. So there is a real sense of fear. And it's also a response to the Democrats fully embracing the Black Lives Matter agenda of cutting funding to the police and running down the police and freeing people from prison. And the public has a sense that the Democrats do not understand this problem. They are unable to do anything about it because they owe their political allegiance to the Black Lives Matter movement. And so there's a huge backlash coming against the Democrats on the issue of crime. Those are the two biggest issues. There are some other issues. The border is a big issue. We have this southern border, which Donald Trump tried to patrol very strenuously, didn't always succeed, and he tried to build a wall, didn't complete it, partly because Democrats wouldn't give him the funding he wanted. But mm -hmm. Joe Biden has thrown the gates wide open. We had a record number of border crossers last year, well over 2 million. And most of those people are here illegally. And there's also drug trafficking associated, obviously not with everybody who comes across the border, but there is a lot of drug trafficking. There are terror suspects who come into the country. And there's a huge amount of anxiety about fentanyl in this country. More than 100,000 Americans died last year from overdoses of fentanyl, often because they're taking other drugs and the fentanyl has been mixed in with those drugs and people don't know about it. So they use too many of those drugs or they use too much of a dose and they stop breathing because fentanyl slows their nervous system down. So we've had this pandemic really of fentanyl overdoses and it's creeping into the schools. This year on Halloween, the big worry among school children and my children were told at school, no political speech, just a warning that they have to check their Halloween candy because smugglers have been disguising fentanyl as Halloween candy and smuggling it through the border. So there's a sense of anxiety wow. about that. And Democrats, again, they're just unwilling to do anything about the border. On the Democratic side, the big motivation to vote is abortion. The Supreme Court earlier this year overruled the Roe versus Wade case in 1973, which provided that abortion was a constitutional right. Now the court says abortion was never a constitutional right. The court simply made that up in 1973 and the issue has to be decided through legislation at the state level. So what you're seeing is in states like California, where I live, where people are very socially liberal, they are preparing to pass some of the most far-reaching, ambitious 
pro-abortion legislation that exists anywhere in the world. You can basically have an abortion right up until the moment of birth in California. In other states, in more socially conservative states, they are restricting abortion almost to the point of making it illegal. So there's been this bifurcation, but Democrats are very worried that Republicans at a national level will try some kind of national abortion legislation, even though the Supreme Court said it has to be decided by the states. The Democrats are motivating many of their core voters, especially women, to vote for them based on this fear of abortion legislation. But I don't know that that is as big an issue as the others. Well, I mean, there's certainly a lot of things on the plate there, and and I suppose we'll have to wait and see what people care about the most. But it does look to me like there's a bit of a swing in the opposite direction to what the Democrats were hoping for here. I mean, there are a couple of governor's races which are taking place at the same time as as the Senate races and the, and the House races. Um, there are some states which have been firmly in the blue uh, or more purple blue than anything else that are looking a lot more red at the moment. Um, are you feeling that that is the case or is it just because, you know, you and I are listening to news outlets that are telling us that? I mean, what do the polls say? First of all, we know how trustworthy they are when they predicted Hillary would walk over Donald Trump and that didn't happen. Have they improved their polling? Do you trust the polls? And if you don't trust the polls and you have your own sources, how are you feeling about this swing that everybody's talking about, this, this red wave? So I trust the polls up to a point. And what the polls were telling us up until August was that Republicans were likely to win the House of Representatives because the Democrats had a very narrow majority that was very vulnerable for a reason I'll explain in a moment, but that the Democrats were likely to keep the Senate and the Democrats might even pick up a seat in the Senate, cementing their majority. That's what the polls told us in August. Right. right now, the polls are telling us that the Democrats are going to lose both houses. They could lose the House by a very large margin, and they could lose the Senate as well by a significant margin. Republicans could have 52 of the 100 seats, perhaps even 53 or 54 at most, I think. But Democrats are looking vulnerable even in states where Democrats almost always win. And the question is why? Now, first of all, can you trust the polls even when they shift in a Republican direction. Polls tend to undercount Republican voters, especially in the last few years, because Republicans don't trust pollsters, also because Republicans are afraid to reveal their political preferences. In the current political environment in the United States, with cancel culture still very much a problem, you are very unlikely to be punished in any way if you reveal a left-wing political preference. But if you reveal a right-wing political preference, you may be shunned, you may lose your job, you may lose business. People are very, very reluctant to reveal their preferences to a stranger, someone conducting a poll, anything like that. So these polls tend to undercount Republicans. So when they move in a more Republican direction, there's reason to think the vote might be even more Republican than the polls are suggesting. Now, the other reason that, that Democrats are sort of at a structural disadvantage this year has to do with their poor performance in previous years. And I'll explain in a moment. The district boundaries are geographic. Each state is assigned a certain number of congressional seats by population in the House of Representatives. The Senate is not by population. Each state has two senators, whether it's a huge state like California or a tiny state like Rhode Island. Each state has two senators. Population doesn't change that. But in the House of Representatives, with the 435 seats, those seats are allocated to states based on proportion. So California, which has actually lost proportion, uh, has lost population relative to other states, lost a seat after the last census. The census is taken every 10 years. The apportionment is thus done every 10 years, and they redraw the map of the districts within each state every 10 years. Who is they? Well, typically the state legislatures of each state redraw the district boundaries. Some states have opted to take the maps away from politicians and to hand them to an independent redistricting commission. We have that in California. But in many states, the map is controlled by the state legislature. The Democrats did poorly in the 2020 election. Despite defeating Donald Trump, the Democrats did very poorly in state legislative races. And so Republicans control the vast majority of state legislatures. On top of that, the country's population is moving toward more Republican states. The free market states of the South and the West, which also have better weather, 
but they're also easier places to find a job. They are attracting population from the Northeast and the Midwest, so much so that whereas in the mid 20th century, black people were moving from the South of the United States to get away from racial discrimination and to find new opportunity in the factories of the North and the Midwest, now you have an exodus in the opposite direction. Black people in cities like Chicago, again, where I grew up, they're leaving those cities because there aren't jobs and opportunities, the schools are bad, the crime is bad, and they're moving toward more conservative states where racial prejudice has really faded into the background and where there are better schools, more jobs, and fewer regulations, lower taxes. So there's this economic migration, plus the weather is better in the South, in places like Florida and in the mountainous area of this country, we do have snowy regions in the Rocky Mountains, but the weather is drier, it's easier to manage. So you're seeing a population shift toward more conservative states. So the Republicans structurally are gaining more seats simply as a function of geography. So the Democrats with a thin, thin majority, I think it was about five or six seats last time I checked, there have been a couple of retirements and things like that. But the Democrats majority was very, very small and it's going to disappear simply through the redrawing of these district boundaries. Republicans are going to win additional seats anyway. The Senate is much different. And because, because the shift in population doesn't mean anything, the Senate really comes down to a question of individual candidates. Mitch McConnell, who is the Republican leader in the Senate, very controversial. He's been there for 16 years. A lot of people want him to go already. He's been around for, for long enough. He almost threw in the towel in August. And he said, given these poll numbers, we don't expect to win the Senate. And the reason he gave was our candidates are weak. I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that's what he said. He said that Republicans were running weak candidates. And what he meant by that was the candidates that won their party nominations in each state were associated with Trump. Mitch McConnell and Trump are at odds because Mitch McConnell was very critical of January 6th. He didn't vote to remove Trump from office during the impeachment trial, but he gave a blistering speech attacking Trump. So Mitch McConnell doesn't like the pro-Trump candidates. So he was disparaging them, saying, well, we're going to lose the Senate because of all these Trump candidates, Trump endorsed right. candidates. But in the last two or three months, as voters have actually compared the Republican candidates to the Democratic candidates, the Democrats have run into a huge problem. And that problem is Joe Biden. And even though Joe Biden is not on the ballot, his policies certainly are. And the Democrats have not distanced themselves from his unpopular policies. There's not one Democrat on the ballot this year who has publicly differed with Biden about anything he has done, whether it's the spending or some of the foreign policy decisions that have been controversial or the border or anything. So Republicans have been able to tie the Democratic candidates to Joe Biden's very weak policies. And as the debates have come up and as people have come out of their summer haze and have started tuning into the issues, the Democratic candidates are unable to defend their policies. In fact, in many cases, they don't even have a policy. And the Republicans are gaining the advantage despite some of their weaknesses as individual personalities. Voters are looking past these personality issues. They're even looking past Trump, who has wisely kept a low profile. And that's the reason the debate is shifting and the polls are shifting in the Republicans' favor in the Senate. So that's what's happened over the last couple of months. And that's why I think in the midterm elections, Republicans will win both houses of Congress. Yeah, I mean, all of that is so complex. It's so much easier than just a traditional Democrat-Republican split because there are Republicans who are very pro-Trump, and in some of the states they're doing very well. Some who are not very pro-Trump are doing well in other places. I heard two really interesting results that maybe you can comment on. And again, I'm not asking you for election-specific information here, although you probably have access to all of this too. But I've heard that in New York... Um, the, the current governor of New York, who actually only inherited the position because of um, Andrew Cuomo's, you know, uh, fondling of women, basically. And now she's in charge of, of uh, Kathy Hogill is her name. She's in charge of New York as governor, and she's running on the Democrat ticket. And there's another guy who's running against her, a Republican. It would have been unthought of to imagine that this would be a close race. And it actually turns out it is. The other one is, I'm, I'm amazed to even say this, Oregon, which is about as blue as a state can get seems to be uh, tilting in the direction of some Republican candidates for both the Senate and for, for the, the gubernatorial race. Do you have any other real surprises that you'd like to tell us about? 
Sure. There's a very interesting Senate race in Washington state, which is just to the north of Oregon, where the incumbent Patty Murray has been there for 30 years. And she was considered an automatic winner almost every time she ran for reelection. She's now facing a very tough challenge from her Republican opponent. So you could see the Republicans take Washington state. There's a very interesting candidate in Connecticut, which is a small state just next to New York. Many of the people who work on Wall Street actually live in Connecticut. It's been a liberal blue state for quite some time. But you have a woman named Leora Levy, who's a Cuban Jewish immigrant who's running on the Republican ticket. And she is challenging the incumbent Senator Richard Blumenthal, who has never really faced a tough contest since he's been elected. So you could see Connecticut flip to the Republicans as well. One of the more fascinating states has been Pennsylvania, where Trump endorsed this TV personality, Dr. Oz, who may be familiar to South African viewers simply because he's on a lot of programs like Oprah Winfrey and things like that. And Dr. Oz is in many ways a very weak candidate. He has very liberal left-wing social views that he quickly revised to appeal to a more conservative electorate. People see him as a bit of a phony. He's Mm -hmm. a very wealthy guy, doesn't play very well in working class Pennsylvania. And even though Trump supported him, many Trump supporters were disappointed with that endorsement. The rumor is that Trump supported Dr. Oz because Melania Trump supported Dr. Oz. So Dr. Oz became the Republican nominee, and he only won by a very small margin in the primary election. You know, we have these primaries where the voters elect the nominees for the respective parties. The Democratic nominee looked for a while to be unstoppable. He's this very large guy named John Fetterman. He Mm -hmm. looks the part of the working class Pennsylvania guy. He's got the tattoos, he's shaved his head, he's got the goatee or whatever he's got. He wears this hooded sweatshirt all the time. And then he had a stroke. And it was terrible, actually. I mean, you never want to see anybody suffer like that. But he had a stroke. And he decided to keep running for senator. And I think the Democrats believed that his persona, his working class persona, was the best fit for that state. So they didn't encourage him to step down so that somebody else could take over. But it turns out that the brain damage or the health problems he's experiencing because of his stroke are very, very serious. And he tried to avoid a debate. You know, we have this tradition. We we like to see our candidates debate at least once before the election. He tried to avoid a debate and he set all these rules for the debate. He wanted closed captioning on a screen if he was going to debate. Well, he appeared in a debate and he could barely finish a complete sentence. So the Democrats are actually quite worried about losing Pennsylvania, a very winnable race to Dr. Oz, who's a very weak Republican candidate. So there's that result could also be surprising. But you're going to see a lot of surprises. You mentioned New York. Lee Zeldin is the Republican. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for a long time. He's one of the nicest guys you could imagine. He has a brilliant resume. He served in the U.S. Army. He's a very, very smart guy And, and also very pleasant family man, has really worked hard as a congressman. And he took this long shot campaign for governor of New York to the point where he's now considered neck and neck with the incumbent Democratic governor. So that could be very interesting, as you point out. There could be a variety of other interesting races. Here in Los Angeles, where I live, we have a mayoral election between two Democrats. So unlike South Africa, where the municipal elections and the national elections are separate, here you can sometimes have municipal elections that happen at the same time as the national elections or the state elections. It all depends on your local government. But we have a mayor election this year, mayoral election in Los Angeles between two Democrats. One of them is a longtime left-wing member of the party. Her name is Karen Bass. She likes Fidel Castro. She's very pro-communist. But in her defense, I will say she was one of the less crazy Democrats during the wild summer of 2020 when people were tearing down statues and things like that. She was one of the few Democrats actually who said they shouldn't do that. And then the other Democrat is this billionaire developer named Rick Caruso. He used to be a Republican. He became a Democrat. And he develops a lot of the very fancy malls in Los Angeles. And he decided on behalf of all the business owners in Los Angeles who are fed up with crime and homelessness and dirt on the street that he was going to run. He's now spent something like $100 million on the race. And he was trailing Karen Bass by double digits in the polls. He's now even or even ahead of her. And it was very interesting. I went to a Karen Bass rally to cover it in late October. And 
Karen Bass said almost nothing about what she will do for Los Angeles. The Democrats are entirely focused on the issue of abortion. They believe that's going to turn out their voters. Local government has nothing whatsoever to do with abortion. Local government doesn't even pay for health care. There's no way in which local government has anything to do with abortion. Yet they are saying that you need to elect a pro-choice candidate, a real pro-choice candidate. You see, Rick Caruso is presumed to be not pro-choice because he is Catholic and has donated to Catholic philanthropies. He's funded a local Catholic school. Catholic Church is against abortion. So the not so subtle insinuation is that he is not really pro-choice, even though he says he is. And Caruso is out there talking about homelessness, talking about crime. And that's why he's creeping up in the polls. And that's why he may actually win. So that gives you a bit of a flavor as to what these elections are like. Anything is possible. There are a lot of cities that could move to the right, or in the case of Los Angeles, a little bit more to the center. And it's because people are fed up with basic governance issues like crime, homelessness, and the economy. It's, it's fascinating. I, I find you know, U.S. politics is something that kind of everybody talks about. And in South Africa, it feels safe to talk about it because it's not really here happening in our backyard. And it mirrors so many of the issues that culturally eventually come our way or that we've already dealt with in some way, shape or form. Um, this obviously has repercussions for what might happen in the presidential election. That's still a way off. But what are people saying? I mean, we, we, we know that, you know, this question of whether or not Trump will run again seems to be both a burden to the Republican Party and also uh, probably one of the few areas where people can get really excited. I hear lots of talk about Ron DeSantis in Florida um, on the Republican ticket. And of course, that is a distinct possibility. But what's happening with the Democrats? I mean, do they have a backup plan? Joe Biden has not said that he will not run. He's clearly an old man. He's clearly not in the best of health. He needs quite a lot of help to be shown around and keeps turning left instead of right and shaking hands with people who aren't there and so on. And I'm not making fun of him. He is just an old man. And, you know, if, if, I, can be, if I can be in a state where I'm more or less coherent and cogent at 78, 79, I'll be very, very happy. But it seems being president of the United States uh, takes its own toll on people. And maybe we should have an upper limit for, for the age of these people. Combined with that, the fact that Kamala Harris is hardly popular, and she's obviously the, the next best thing for the Democrats. What other options do they have? You know, it's a very tough question for Democrats. The television show Saturday Night Live, which tends to be very pro-Democrat, did a little comedy sketch before Halloween where they created a sort of horror movie, and the whole idea of the joke was that the scary thing that was happening on Halloween was that Democrats couldn't figure out who their alternative candidate was going to be. And they were terrified that Biden was going to run again. So that was the gag. And it was very well done. But you're right. Biden is too old. And in many ways, Democrats are struggling in the polls because he is simply not leading the country and voters feel that lack of leadership. So I think Given that Democrats are likely to do very poorly in the midterms, there's going to be a concerted effort to push him out. The problem is that Kamala Harris is the only person in the United States who is less popular than Joe Biden. And she's not really an alternative, even though she's the vice president. So then you start going down the list. Well, what other Democrats are there? There's Pete Buttigieg, who's the secretary of transportation, young guy. He's gay. He would be first in that sense. And he ran a very strong presidential campaign in the Democratic primary. But people have the sense that he's a lightweight, that he's not really up to the job. He's been absent from a lot of the key transportation crises that we've had. I mean, it's not as if our transportation network is in a good state. We've had this massive problem with supply chains. We've had all kinds of transportation failures, airplane problems. He often seems to be very much at arm's length, not really managing anything. So he hasn't really acquitted himself well in government, even though he looks very good on television and he can say the right things. He doesn't really do very much very well. Then you look at governors. Are there any successful Democratic governors? Well, my governor in California, Governor Gavin Newsom, he's got a massive amount of money. He's got a huge digital operation. But people see him as a pretty boy with nice hair and nice teeth who has absolutely no accomplishments to speak of in four years. There are other Democrats who've done a little bit more, but they don't really capture the heart of the party or even the electorate. 
I think they will solve this problem because you're not going to have this vacuum continue forever. They will figure it out. And I think they may actually reach outside of politics to pick someone like billionaire Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban, he's actually a friend of mine. He's the owner of the Dallas Mavericks basketball team. He's a very nice guy, very approachable. And he's a Democrat and he's got a lot of money and he could probably bankroll his own campaign. He is very energized, very smart. And he comes from an interesting background. He could possibly be the Democrats candidate. It would have to be someone like that, or perhaps even Michelle Obama could be enticed into the political fray. So they might, they'll come up with somebody. I, I don't think the Democrats are going to run with Biden, but it's not quite the horror show that they think it is. They will find a way. On the Republican well, side, the, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, what about the Republicans? Yeah, so Republicans feel pretty good right now. In fact, I don't think any midterm election has felt as good for Republicans in the last 20 or 30 years. They're coasting, they feel great. The, the more the polls show Republicans might win, the more excited they get to vote. So the polls become a sort of positive feedback loop. There are more Republicans who want to vote because they think they're going to win. All that ends on November 9th, which is the day after the election, when Republicans face the question of who will be the nominee in 2024. The presidential election essentially begins the day after the midterm election. <laughs> and Trump is the strongest leader in the party, but Republicans understand that he carries a lot of baggage. That's where January 6th becomes an issue. It doesn't become an issue in the midterms. It becomes an issue... November 9th, because it was a huge miscalculation. Even if you don't think Trump did something wrong or that he should be punished or whatever, he made a huge strategic miscalculation by hoping that this protest march he was organizing would exert any kind of effective pressure on Congress to reconsider the Electoral College vote. So he made a poor mistake, really bad judgment, and that's putting it charitably. I mean, others would say that it was an assault on democracy and so forth. But in any event, it's a huge problem for Americans. Americans want Trump's effective leadership. There's a sense, however, that they just don't want the drama surrounding Trump. Right. And Republicans know that. So you have some Republicans who are Trump supporters who are very excited that he will come back, that he could bring the voters out again. There's nobody else who excites voters both for and against as much as Donald Trump does. But there are other Republicans, including people who like Trump, who view the ability to win as the most important criterion for electing a candidate, and they don't believe Trump can win, so they're looking at alternatives. You mentioned Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida. He could be a very strong alternative. And, and one thing I just want to point out about DeSantis, one of the turning points in this midterm election, one of the points at which Republicans really started to gain steam, was when he sent a plane load of 50 migrants that had been shipped to, to Florida. So. They came across the Mexican border. The federal government sent them to Florida and Ron DeSantis sent them to Massachusetts to a place called Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard is a lovely little island off the coast. You have to take a ferry to get there. And it's the home of the rich and famous. Barack Obama has a seaside mansion there and a lot of other famous people, primarily Democrats, have their homes there. And Martha's Vineyard absolutely went crazy when these 50 migrants showed up and suddenly the wealthy, rich, elite Democrats were being asked to shoulder the same burden they had imposed on the poor Republican small towns of the border region, you know, and they couldn't do it. They got rid of the migrants within 24 hours. They shipped them to a military base. And what DeSantis really did was he exposed the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party elite, not only the fact that they couldn't handle the migrant crisis they were imposing on other people, but that they didn't care about these people. They didn't care about the migrants. They didn't care about the communities. So it was a very effective political gesture. DeSantis is very good at that. However, I don't think he'll run against Trump for the simple reason that DeSantis is only governor of Florida because of Trump. When Trump mm -hmm. endorsed Ron DeSantis four years ago, DeSantis was running in third place in the Republican primary for governor of Florida. Nobody was behind him. Trump came in, said, this is my guy. DeSantis zoomed to first place, he won the nomination, and then he squeaked through and won the election. So there's a sense in which DeSantis running against Trump, if Trump does run for president, and I think he will, there's a sense in which it would reflect a kind of ingratitude. It would also split the Republican Party in a way that would be very difficult to put back together again. So I think that if it's not Trump, the nominee will probably be someone else. And then you start to look at other alternatives. In my mind, the strongest alternative is a guy named Tom Cotton, who's a senator, from Arkansas, very strong military background, incredibly smart guy, worked at a law firm on Wall Street as well. We went to college together. He's a friend of mine. 
So I have a bit of a bias there, but I do think Tom Cotton would offer Trump-like policies without Trump's personality. He is a very serious person. He is young as well, so he's got that going for him. And I think he will probably make a run. The advantage he has is he's not seen as either for Trump or against Trump. He's one of the few characters in American politics not tied to Donald Trump in some way, whether for or against. He was in politics before Trump got in, so he doesn't owe his career to Trump even though he's very young. He was elected to Congress in 2012 and he won his Senate seat in 2014. So well before Trump. So I think that will be interesting. But again, it's a more difficult dilemma in some ways on the, on the Republican side because people feel so besieged by the media and the cancel culture and by the Democrats that they view attacks on Trump as attacks on Republicans as a whole, even if they would privately prefer another candidate. Unraveling that bit of psychodrama will take a lot of work. Well, we started by talking about the media. It seems like we're going to end by talking about the media too. Um, what is their role in all of this? And and what, what do you suppose their their influence may bring to bear in this election? You know, we, we usually have some kind of October surprise. Um, today is the last day of October. Who knows? There might be something else thrown in here in the last minute. Um, we've got it's the election. to see how much the media are on the back foot in this election. In 2010, mm -hmm. the Republicans had another very good year. That was the year that the Tea Party movement stormed Congress, figuratively, of course, not literally, and won a record number of seats in the House. But Republicans fell short in the Senate, even though there were many winnable races in the Senate, partly because they nominated these candidates who were ideological firebrands but had other problems with them. And the media really played a role in highlighting those weaknesses. This time around, the media are trying the same thing. They've been doing one story after another about a guy named Herschel Walker. He's the Republican candidate for Senate in the state of Georgia. He's a former football star. He also has something of a sordid personal history. And so there are all these stories coming out about wives and girlfriends and abortions and all kinds of things. The difference this time, 12 years later, is that the alternative conservative media is so much bigger and so much more well-developed than it was in 2010. And there's so much mistrust of the establishment media that the big establishment media outlets are no longer able to end a Senate race simply by exposing some scandal or another in a candidate's background. People simply don't buy into the media narrative as much as they once did. They'll consider the facts, they'll consider the reporting, but they're not going to let the media choose their candidates for them. And, and in my mind, that's a very positive development. People are thinking more critically about the media simply because they have more choices. So that's very good. But they will play a role in the presidential race, which gives them a lot more control because it is a national race. And again, because Trump is a media candidate, when Trump gets into the political fray once again, he will go to the New York Times, he'll go to CNN, even though he attacks them and makes fun of them, those are still the outlets he will use. And so that gives the media a lot more control over the internal debate, even though it's inside the party, the media will have a lot more control over the selection of the candidates in 2024. All right. So listen, there's a lot to look forward to. I think you must be very, very busy. You must also already be feeling, you know, quite, quite exhausted by the fact that you have to try and cover all of this, get all the news across, make sure that you're informed about all the various races all over the place. And uh, you also then have to manage a, a huge stable of people in the newsroom who are all doing this as well. Um, I, I hope that we have some interesting news out of this. I think there are probably lots of answers to this next question, but if you could summarize what you think might be better for South Africa? Do you think that any kind of result in this midterm election means anything to us? Or are we too distant from all of this to, to have to worry about it? That's a fantastic question. I do think that the main result of this will be Republicans are going to start to put a break on the spending. If Republicans control even one House of Congress, as it looks mm -hmm. like they will almost certainly do, then Biden and the Democrats will not be able to spend quite as freely, and that will put a break on inflation. And I think that that will have a global impact. I think people around the world will benefit from not having those inflationary pressures added to by fiscal spending from the United States, which obviously can affect the world price level by spending too much money. I don't know that Africa has really played a role in this, except in one sense. 
the Republican class that will be coming in, that is to say the candidates who are running right now, are probably the most racially diverse group of candidates that the Republicans have ever run before. And that wasn't through some process of racial selection or anything like that. It's just because there are a large number of candidates from African-American backgrounds, Hispanic candidates, a lot of women are running, people are stepping up. And I think there's some, I think, uh, hope for South Africa in that as well, because when you move beyond identity politics in South Africa, then you start to talk about what's possible, what can be achieved. And I think South Africa's stumbling block over the last 30 or 40 years, obviously with, with apartheid and the end of apartheid, but continuing into the post-apartheid era has always been the question of race and identity. And once you can move beyond that, then I think you can start to have very interesting conversations about what the future can bring. And that brings me to my other project that I'm working on in addition to news coverage at Breitbart, which is my biography of Rhoda Kadali, my mother-in-law who passed away sadly in April, but the book is now finished. It's sitting at the publisher, University of Johannesburg is publishing it. It's called Rhoda, Comrade Kadali, You Are Out of Order. And it's been a labor of love and Rhoda was really fascinating. She understood politics both in South Africa and the United States. She was the first person I knew who predicted that Trump would win the 2016 presidential election. She saw that long before I did. And, and so it's been fascinating to go through her whole history from her upbringing in District 6 through her work at UWC on the Gender Equity Unit, her work on the South African Human Rights Commission, then with the Impumalelo Awards Trust, and all of her writing over the years on various subjects in South Africa. It's been absolutely fascinating, a real window into South Africa really, but one that I hope Americans will also benefit from because as you mentioned, a lot of the issues do overlap. And I think there are things that Americans can learn from South Africa as well, both positive and negative. You know, in, in some ways, South Africans have a better understanding of the balance of power and the checks and balances within a constitutional system I'm often struck by the way that Americans conduct politics. It seems sometimes completely unmoored to any idea about the responsibilities of governance. And I think in South Africa, perhaps because it's a more recent constitution, it's an immediate post-conflict society, but I find that South Africans in some ways have a clearer idea of the purpose and role of some of these constitutional principles and institutions things that we have taken for granted in the United States. And, and the, there's a danger in taking them for granted, which is that you can destroy them very easily. Yeah. So I think there's a lot that Americans will learn from Rhoda's biography because it's a window onto South Africa that's provided by someone who also understood American politics very closely. I look forward to seeing that biography. I wish you luck with its uh, launch. And of course, if you if you need any help here when it comes out, then we'll, be, we'll be more than happy to give yeah, it a- Yeah, sometime I think early in the next year, it'll come out. It'll be a lot of fun and I think a great tribute to Rhoda, hopefully. But yes, I'm looking forward to talking about it with you then. Amazing. Joel, thank you so much for your time. Um, have a good week and let's talk again and see what the results we'll are. see what happens, yeah. Great stuff. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Joel Pollack from Breitbart News.